the Redbird Report podcast with the TV voice of the cards, Danny Mack, and Cards World Series champion Brad Thompson on 101 ESPN. The Redbird Report on 101 ESPN. Brad Thompson, Dan McLaughlin, and the Cardinals are rolling. They are 21 and 6 in the month of August. This has been one of their best months in the history of the organization. And Brad, let's jump right into it. It is a good time right now to be a Cardinal fan. They're playing well. They're exciting. They've got individual performances that are turning out to be historic. This is a good time to be a fan. It's a blast, man. I mean, right, this is uh, this is all you can expect is being down the stretch here. And you and I have talked about it quite a bit, uh, doing games on air and off air. Look, once the All-Star break hit, it was going to be a sprint. The schedule was jam-packed. There's plenty of opportunity. And the Cardinals find themselves in the midst of a schedule that is very advantageous. I mean, they got a six-game lead right now over the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, as the Brewers you know, did win against the Pirates yesterday. So they've been trying to keep pace here. But, I mean, six games is a sizable gap. Then you couple in the fact that they, you know, they, they're playing the Reds right now. They've got the Cubs. They've got the Pirates. Dan, there's a lot of ground to be gained. And like you said, this isn't smoke and mirrors. This is not a product of who you're playing right now. It's just the kind of baseball you are playing. The starting pitching has been solid. Your bullpen has been solidified a little bit. Maybe we'll get into the left side of the bullpen because I find it kind of curious right now. Uh, but your offense is rolling. Since the All-Star break, you have the best offense in baseball in pretty much every single category. Uh, so what is, uh, what's not to like? So where do you want to start? Where do we want to jump in today? I, I want to start with Albert. Um, I didn't see this. I, I didn't see this happening. I, I thought it would be fun. I thought it would be great. I thought there would be special moments. Um, and I talked to Ali yesterday before the game, and he said, hey, if, if the big guy, he goes, if number five keeps hitting, he's still, he's going to play. And sure enough, number five is hitting. And 694 that he hit last night. Um, and some of these pitches, man, that he's hitting are not bad pitches. Last night, Detweiler, I mean, that pitch was up, it was away, and he knocks it out of the ballpark. It's not supposed to be happening when you're 42 years old. The ball that he hit in Chicago, same thing. It was at his eyes. Uh, <laughs> he, I thought maybe the most impressive at bat that he had, Brad, over the last week was a pinch hitting appearance on Saturday night, and he hits a 110 mile an hour laser to Dansby Swanson that almost knocks him over. I, he's just hitting everything hard, and it's against the right handers, too. So I think now you have to look at with what Albert is doing, he's going to stay in the lineup. He's going to play. Now, if it's Spencer Strider, no, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But some of the other right handers, yeah, it makes sense for him to play. He's earned the reps, and that's the thing. And if you're Ollie Marmol, if you're the Cardinals, this is the best case scenario that you have Albert, one of the best to have ever played the game, that is forcing your hand to have him in there day in and day out. Because what, whether, and I know Ali has addressed this, and I know he's talked candidly about it uh, with us as well. There is a pressure when a guy is approaching a milestone like 700 to get him some sort of at bats and try to figure out a way to magically like make it happen for him. Well, I don't think you need magic right now. No. Albert just needs reps. I mean, you look, there's 33 games left. And look, Albert's not going to play in every single one of these games down the stretch. But if you just look back at his last 33 games that he has played, and that's 23 starts in those last 33 games. Uh, he's hit 11 home runs in that time period. He's also hitting about 380. So to think 700 is uh, an unfathomable amount, it's just not. He's sitting at 694 now. It was an 0-2 mistake, as you mentioned, off of uh, Ross Detweiler. Uh, it, it's six away from 700. He's only two away from A-Rod. And all the guy needs is some space and opportunity, and he's going to get it. The other guy I want to talk about that is lending itself to having now length in the lineup, but we've been waiting all year, essentially. We've, we've seen flashes of it, and it, it's Tyler O'Neill. Um, Jimmy and I were talking about it in the game last night. I mean, I think his swings look different. The swings over the weekend look different. If you get him rolling with Arenado, Goldie, Albert, it's it's a lineup that is scary, and Corey Dickerson is hitting the ball. He had three more hits last night, including a home run. So the the key, and I've said this from day one, I really believe the key for this team, because you're going to have old, uh, Goldie and Arnado all year. I mean, you know those guys are going to be there. But if, if Tyler O'Neill can be Tyler O'Neill, uh, the guy that we saw at the end of last year in the second half, then you're talking about the length in the lineup, you're talking about another dangerous guy in the lineup, and you're talking about this lineup being one of the more formidable lineups in baseball. So he's such a key, and he's starting to hit the ball. 
Yeah, I believe it to be a necessity, really, when you look at this, because, I mean, that's what you that's what you had coming in, or at least the idea of coming into this season is Tyler O'Neill is going to be an MVP candidate because he forced himself into that conversation last year. And when you come into a season, you bank on that and then you get the production that you got from him early on. There is a, there's a quite a fall off, really. And. Fortunately for the Cardinals, they've had different guys step up throughout the season, not in that power role, but you've had Goldie have his MVP season. You've had Nolan. And then I guess, well, the guy that would have stepped up is, in fact, Albert Pujols, who we were just talking about. But you and I talk about this a lot with Tyler O'Neill. He's got a skill set that not too many guys in this league have. He's got a, a great blend of power, speed, great defensive uh, player, a couple of gold gloves. But the, the power that he's showing off right now is real, and I agree with the fact that the swing looks different. He looks free. He looks a little bit easier. I guess as free and easy as a guy that's all muscle can be is uh, he looks up like he's not overthinking it up there. And he kind of talked about that, of simplifying the process, of not worrying so much and just going out there and letting himself, uh, letting himself have success. That's the key. That I think we forget about this a lot of times, and it's it's actually refreshing to hear professional athletes talk about it. I know Paul DeYoung has gone through this as well, probably going through it again right now as he's had his struggles. It, you get to the big leagues, you don't have it all figured out. You don't. There's going to be adjustments. There's going to be physical adjustments. There's going to be mental adjustments. I really like Tyler talking about his routine and Ollie talking about the routine of Tyler O'Neill. Uh, of having that consistency day in and day out. Uh, you've seen the routine of Albert Pujols for you know a decade plus. What that guy does day in and day out, he's regimented in what he does. And Goldie is regimented in what he does. And the results on the field, they don't affect how you are day in and day out because you know you put the work in. I think that that's what Tyler O'Neill is figuring out. Not that he didn't work before, but maybe he didn't have a consistent routine and a program that he could always fall back on. Yeah, it's a good point. I uh, I loved uh, what Adam Wainwright did on on Sunday night. Oh my gosh! And I think if you're any kind of uh, baseball player, you're a kid. I don't care if you're in sports, whatever sport, you probably need to do yourself a favor and go back and watch what he was talking about warming up for the game. There, there's Brad. We could do three hours on what he was talking about. But to the greater point of me being a guy in the media. Uh, I'm going to take this view, and then you can take maybe the view of what it, you, you pulled away from it being a starter and a former major leaguer and a reliever. But um, I, I think for us to grow the game, things like that need to happen. You, you can't tell me that there wasn't some kid watching that across the country or wherever you're watching and going, man, that was pretty cool. I, I want to watch that Adam Wainwright guy. Man, that was neat. Oh, I'm a baseball player, and I loved what he had to say, and I can't wait for that next time he starts. I, I want to watch what he's doing now uh, warming up, or I'm going to watch that next start. I wonder if other guys do that. Kids think. They have imaginations. They they want to know if that's how it's done. I had a great conversation with Ali and, and Skip yesterday in, in Ali's office about that we all came to the conclusion we need to grow the game and there's ways to grow the game. And this is one of them. Um, there's multiple ways to, to grow the game and, and make it appealing for the fans and for young kids. Um, and my point to them was, you know, and I said this on the game last night too, we're, we're willing to shove a microphone in front of a face of a guy that's getting ready to drive 300 miles an hour. And he's five minutes away. He's sitting on the right. starting line and we're, we're going to do that. And his life is on the line. You're telling me we can't do and be creative with something to, to make it more uh, more exposed, the, the game in a good way, um, whether it's a, you know, a guy that's got a night off. You know, maybe it's uh, the starter that came out of the game and you get him right after he starts. We, we did that back in the early 2000s. I did that uh, on some of the games. Um, I, I think it's great. I, I think it was smart. Um, and I know some people would frown upon it and say, well, you know, he's in the middle of his job and he's got to be doing that. And I get that too. I understand that. It's got to be the right guy to do it. And like I was talking with um, Skip about it, he said, man, he, he saw him getting mic'd up and he thought, this is not good. We don't want this. Then he saw it. He watched it when it was happening. He goes, this is awesome. He goes, man, we got to do this all the time. He goes, this is great. So I, I can see various viewpoints on this, but I think the greater point is let's grow the game. Let's expose the athletes. Let's expose the personalities because personalities sell. And uh, I thought it was uh, awesome. And I, I just thought from that perspective, it was amazing. And I'm sure from your perspective, as you listen to him and having been a pitcher, you're probably, it probably brought you back to when you were playing and you probably drew on some of that stuff and made you reflect and go, God, that was just great stuff. It was great to hear. Yeah, starting just with the stuff that he's talking about, he went into a, a lot of different things, but I, I really enjoyed what he was talking about. And again, it's a takeaway. I don't care if you're a young pitcher 
baseball player, football player, or you're somebody at your job uh, who just has a, a routine. I love he, he was talking about routine versus superstition is that, hey, look, routine is great unless it turns into a superstition. Uh, I, and I love what he said. If they told me right now that I had eight pitches to get loose, he said, I could do that because you are what your brain tells you that you are. That's how he thinks when he is out there. So when you're watching Adam Wainwright go compete and he's got 87, 88 miles an hour in the bag and he's flipping up breaking balls and he's just he's just inventing stuff out there on the mountain. He's pitching. I mean, he, he's doing the art of pitching. A lot of times I, I guarantee people are at home wondering, like, how do guys not hit that? Because he's got them set up and he believes in every single thing that he is doing. A belief is a very powerful thing uh, and he's got a ton of it. To your point of growing the game and doing more stuff like this, dude, I would love it. I would, I was enthralled by, by hearing Adam and it wasn't just because it was Adam Wainwright. Look, we're, we're friends with Adam. We love the dude. He's one of the best ever. Uh, I, I don't care who it is. And I don't know if they're going to be dropping knowledge like Adam did and, and taking that to that level. Uh, but I, I want to know more about the players. I want to dig more into so, the insight. Let, let me ask you this, though. If they would have come to you as a player, would you have done it? And do you think your no. teammates would have done it? No, I wouldn't have. And I don't think Tony would have allowed it. Sure. First of all. Uh, but uh, no, I wouldn't have. Because here's here's why. It comes down to risk versus reward. Okay. The reward of growing the game is a big one. But as a player, and especially as a young player, and Adam Wainwright obviously been in this yeah, game for nearly good point. 20 years yep. to pull it off. Uh, but but as a young player, what, what's the reward here? Like You, you want to think about growing the game, and that idea is awesome. But you also think, okay, I'm going to wear this. I'm going to get mic'd up before the game. Eyeballs are already on me. People are wondering what I'm doing. What if it doesn't go well? Like if Adam had that game and then he gave up 10 in the first inning, how are we looking at what he did? In that ball game. That's right. You know, I, I, I think that it ends up being a little bit different. So how do you make it a normal thing for players that this is just kind of part of what we do? That ends up being the hard part of it. Interesting. It is interesting. Uh, a couple more things. I'm going to stay on the pitching front. Jojo Romero is emerging now as the top lefty coming out of the pen. Fine by me. His stuff plays. Ali and I were talking about that yesterday. I mean, it's it's been really good. Really good. I loved what I saw out of Zach Thompson last night. Brad, he was hitting 99 down in the zone, 99 down in the zone. And uh, Henesis Cabrera just wasn't getting the job done. He's not missing bats. He's getting beat up. He goes down to the minor leagues. And by the way, you got Steven Matz around the corner. So we'll wrap it up with this. You got Steven Matz. You got Jack Flaherty coming up on a rehab assignment. One more, which I think is good. He may not like it, but remember, he forced the issue last time, and it didn't work out that well. So let's make sure he's ready. But you got a couple of guys coming back that should be able to help this club. For sure. And with Flaherty, it's not even like they're, they're not as concerned. It's my understanding that he's ready or not. It's more about the logistics of the move, making it past September 1st so you don't have to option down another pitcher who's got to be down there for 15 days. So I'm with you on that. I don't care if you like it or not. This is kind of how it's going to be, and you can help uh, in, in five more days from now. And I hope it goes well because I'm, I'm excited about the addition of Jack. Steven Matz could end up being a weapon. The two lefties that you were talking about, JoJo Romero and Zach Thompson, Dude, these guys are good. Yes, and they are. There, there was conversation with Zach Thompson of why he wasn't back sooner. In all fairness, Zach wasn't throwing the ball well at Memphis for a little bit. But then he got back, got his opportunity, and he's letting it rip, and he's taking advantage of it. JoJo Romero's coming into ball games, and he does not look like a, a young pitcher that has, doesn't have a ton of experience. He's come in, throwing his fastball, throwing his breaking ball, also has a feel for the changeup that he could throw against the right-handers, and he's become a weapon. Now, we know this, though. Come October, October baseball is different. And the, the stakes are raised and, you know, look, there's a lot that goes into it. Can these guys emerge into October lefties? I believe that Ryan Helsley could be an October guy. I think the Gallegos could be an October guy. We're going to find out with these lefties because it's necessary. You need at least one of them. Boy, I would like both of them to be able to be go-to guys down the stretch. They're not going to get tested a ton with the schedule that the Cardinals have here. They will on the West Coast trip. They're going to face the Dodgers and the Padres and the Brewers. That's going to be a long road trip where some tests will happen. But I hope they continue to emerge because it's a big need for this club. Losing Hennessy Cabrera, and uh, when I say losing him, it's like he got sent down. He didn't perform. But not having him out there the way that he was has put this bullpen in a little bit of a hole. And JoJo Romero right now and Zach Thompson are trying to fill that. Buddy, great stuff. Thanks for doing it as always. And uh, we'll catch up again at the end of the week, I'm sure. Hey, I, I miss you already. I hope you're having fun in Cincinnati. You left me behind, but that's okay. 
I do miss you. You know I miss you. I know you. you do, buddy. Okay, that's BT. I'm Danny Mack, and this is 101 ESPN. You've been listening to the Redbird Report podcast with the TV voice of the cards, Danny Mack, and cards World Series champion Brad Thompson on 101 ESPN.